me off to the I'm going to call this uh, joint meeting of the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee with the City Commission. We're going to convene this work session on September 4th. The hour is shortly after 6 o'clock. Would you please call the roll, Ms. Riggs? Yes, I was actually wondering if we could just start here to my left and go around and say uh, your name and then if you're on the City Commission or PRAC, please. Uh, Rocky Smith, City Commission. Karen Murray, PRAC. Jeff Sargent, PRAC. Uh, Derek Kugel, PRAC. Denise McGriff, City Commission. Troy Bollinger, PRAC. Frank O'Donnell, City Commission. Lisa Novak, PRAC. <clears throat> Rachel Lyle Smith, City Commission. Bill Daniels, PRAC. Chris Cook, PRAC. Alicia Hammock, PRAC. All right. So our first item on the agenda is the discussion item of 19-493, the Clackamette Park Master Plan, sponsored by Community Service Director Phil Lewis. I see we've got two gentlemen in front of us. Are you going to lead off, Phil? Uh, yes, I will. Thank right. you, Commission President. Uh, so today uh, we're going to be discussing the Clackamette Park Master Plan. As you're aware, uh, this has been an item on our agenda for, for quite some time. Uh, we made a presentation uh, in late spring to uh, bring the commission up to speed on where we were in the process of developing a, a citywide kind of uh, public engagement process master plan to look at uh, what we should do with Clackamette Park. Uh, of that process, we had uh, three major components. Um, which included the um, boat ramp, the RV park, and the city-owned properties across the street from Clackamette Park, and the overflow parking. So those uh, facilities are shown here. Uh, again, just to, to rephrase, uh, Clackamette Park is our only uh, designated regional park and serves not only uh, the residents of Oregon City, but members uh, throughout our community at large. Um, one of the requests when we made that presentation was to come back with uh, additional options that would be supported uh, by the commission uh, that did not include um, using so much of the green space for the boat ramp. So as you recall, the, um, uh, the Oregon State Marine Board has been working with staff to identify an option for relocating uh, the boat ramp downriver in order to uh, mitigate some of the current concerns uh, that are happening uh, for users in the current location. Uh, so the Oregon State Mar Marine Board uh, made a recommendation to move the boat ramp 350 feet downriver. Uh, that was seen as not an option by the commission at the time. And so we went back to the drawing board and tried to incorporate uh, other options that might be feasible for uh, the, the boat ramp. Uh, one of those options was to move the ramp about 250, I'm sorry, about 200 feet downstream instead of uh, 350 feet downstream. Uh, we have a consultant with us today uh, who conducted the hydrology study, and I'm going to have him come up and uh, give a little bit of a presentation background on his technical memo, which was included in your staff packet and uh, he'll be able to hopefully answer some of the questions that came up during the original uh, presentation by staff in the technical aspects of the, um, of, of the why of the, uh, the hydrology report and moving up the boat ramp. So at this time, I would like to um, invite up Hans Hadley with West Consultants. No, okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, and he'll speak a little bit to his technical memo and uh, options for uh, repurposing the boat ramp, removing the boat ramp. Thanks, Phil. Uh, yeah, so I conducted the original hydraulics and hydrology study for the boat ramp relocation, or the new boat ramp, and then uh, not too often long ago, um, Phil asked if I could, or actually the Marine Board, and Phil asked if I could relook at that, uh, the location of the ramp and see if there was any issues with moving it further upstream. Uh, from where we had proposed to move it. And um, so if you read in the memo, there are some issues, not issues that can't be overcome, but there but there they would be changes to the, the plan. And, and, and the, the issue really more is is that as you move it upstream, you the hydraulic conditions and the sediment trans 
transport conditions, sedimentation issues that you're dealing with at the existing ramp and the scour issues, it's, you're, you're moving closer and closer to the issue that you already are dealing with. So if we can get the ramp further away from the existing ramp, the less of those issues that you're gonna have to deal with. So uh, what I wanted to do is just kind of show you um, through a series of aerial photos what has been going on. I know that you've already realized what's been going on with the sedimentation issues, but this is a photo from 2003, so you can see um, does this laser work? It does. Yeah, I don't know if anybody can see that, but obviously you can see here's the existing ramp. Um, here's the north shore of the river, and they're really, you, you can start to see a little bit of sediment um, depositing in this area right in here. And then as you advance through slides, in 2007, you see this uh, sand and gravel bar <coughs> starting to form directly across from the ramp. And what, what's happening is because this is forming here, you're pushing more of the water to the south side and it's accelerating the flow between the gravel bar and the existing ramp. So that's exacerbating the scour conditions that, are, that have caused the ramp to get undermined and, and the, the resulting repair needing to be done. Oops, did I turn this off? You may have blacked out the screen. There's a black oh, sorry, there wrong button. <laughs> Too close together. Uh, here is August 2011. You can, uh, again, you can see this gravel bar continuing to build and, again, putting more and more pressure on the ramp. Here's 2016, and not only is it here, now it's moved on downstream into this area, so it's much bigger than it was before. Wow. So you're, you're causing this whole stretch through here to, to have greater hydraulic issues, velocities, and shear stresses uh, along that south shore. So um, what the river would want to do is move and, and erode this whole bank line. Uh, but the reason it can't is because right in here we have some riprap that kind of starts right in here and, and continues along this uh, bank right in here. So that's preserving this bank line, but it's causing this area to be uh, eroded and, and uh, thus the ramp being undermined. So just uh, kind of a reminder, there was some significant flood events that occurred in the late 90s. A very large one was in February 96, another one in January 97, and, and again in December 98. And then in uh, January 2009, there was about a 10-year flood. So we've had some pretty significant floods of late. And um, one of the issues that I think is happening is when we look at sediment deposition in rivers, we have to wonder, well, where is that sediment coming from? And oftentimes we can look upstream and we can see eroding banks happening. You can see other sources of, of that sediment. Uh, well, I looked upstream and kind of worked my way up through looking at the old Google Earth images and, and you don't really see a whole lot has happened uh, right up to the bank line until you get about 13 and a half miles upstream. And then what you see is this, uh, back in 1994, this gravel pit complex, this gravel mining operation uh, in 94. Well, since then you've had the 96 flood and mul multiple other large floods. Um, and then in 2002, uh, one of the first photos, there's another one from Google Earth, but it's not, <laughs> not very good, but you see basically the river has breached the gravel pit complex. And so you've created a huge disturbance wow. upstream that is now pushing sediment downstream and ultimately it's ending up at the confluence of the Flacamas and the Willamette River. And so that's what you're dealing with today is all that sediment. Um, so give us some indication of where this is. Is there anything that we would know where this is? I mean, I, uh, I honestly, I'm not you that familiar. You've got 224 there, which I'm seeing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that familiar with this area. I just was looking on What's Google Earth. And oh, there's Odell Road. Mm -hmm. Odell it says Road. Cascade Trail, Trail I think, yeah. right in here. Oh, Barton Park Road. Okay, we're up by Barton Park. Okay, yeah. now so, I kind of figured out where we are. <laughs> so when you have a large flood that disrupts uh, like a, a gravel mining complex and the channel changes, lots of things are happening. Well, all that sediment is now available to the stream. Well, it can take many, many years for that uh, sediment to work its way downstream. 
and it really depends on the series of flood events. You know, do you have a bunch of high flows that are moving it down faster, or do you have uh, you know moderate or low flow conditions in the winter that it's just kind of slowly moving? So, so you know, it it started to show up. Um, I mean, I go back. When was it? In so it was 2007. So you know, maybe 10 years or so after the big flood in '96. Um, I, I don't know exactly when the gravel pit breached, but my suspicion it was around that 96, 97 time frame. So, in other words, I, I just wanted you all to understand that things are changing at this location, and they have been changing for a while, and they're going to continue to change. And that's why uh, one of the reasons why we kind of picked the location for the ramp that we did, we were trying to uh, thread the needle, so to speak, between the issues that are happening at the existing ramp where there's no riprap to protect the banks. And then as you get closer to the Willamette, you have a lot of debris that, com that comes down the Willamette during a flood and piles up right in this area. So we were trying to kind of pick a spot that made the most sense between the erosion issues that you're having at the existing ramp and all the debris issues that you would be having as you get closer to the confluence with the Willamette. And so that's why the spot was picked that we picked. So if you want to move it upstream, uh, what you're doing is you're, you're getting it closer to the end of this riprap revetment. So it's already kind of following, falling apart, so to speak. So as you move it further upstream, then you are then dealing with the issues at that location that might be stuck. Is there? No. So how far into the beginning of the riprap from the upstream side are we for this proposed location? I think that figure is in here. So here, here's the figure that shows. Here's where we originally planned to put the ramp, and then this is about 150 feet upstream. So you're kind of right at the very beginning of where the riprap starts. And so mm -hmm. there's a part of moving the ramp is to create a very robust rock riprap revetment around the ramp to protect it and basically extending this riprap further upstream than it currently is. So. In other words, you would need more uh, erosion protection for this ramp, this location versus the location that we are proposing. So there's already riprap along here. Certainly as we uh, cut this bank down to put the ramp in, we would again replace riprap in that area to protect it. Um, but we're not having to extend it upstream and downstream because we're already tying into existing riprap revetment. So, and also the other issue is that as you move it upstream, you're kind of getting closer and closer to the pinch from this gravel bar. And so as that gravel bar continues to grow, um, you might start getting usability issues with the ramp at this upstream location sooner than you would at the downstream location, just as the sediment accumulates in that area. Uh, at uh, low flow and low tide conditions, you may have a situation where the water is just too shallow for the boats to get in and out uh, during those time periods. Um, so there's a, a potential usability issue that you might be dealing with sooner with this moving the ramp upstream versus uh, the proposed location. So um, let me sneak back. Is, is there any other questions? And, yeah. <clears throat> so, Hans, even if we put it in the originally proposed location further downstream, how long is it going to be before we run into issues there? <laughs> that's a magic question, right? <laughs> I don't know, and that, that's the reality is that you're, you're dealing with continued sedimentation issue. <laughs> Has the bulk of that sediment come down, and you're and you're dealing with what you're going to deal with, or is there continue going to continue to be sedimentation happening? What tends to happen is once that bar forms, it continues to grow because it changes the hydraulics in that local location and causes sediment to want to deposit there. So um, in the old days, they'd go in and they'd dredge that material out, and you'd be back to to the starting point. But that's not really the way it is anymore. 
Um, I do know that on the north side, Dull Beach, there I've talked to another consultant that's working up there, and, and they have said that they're still continuing to see some sedimentation issues going on. So it's not, it's not like it's stopped and it's just kind of staying static. It's continuing to build sediment. So, so it's possible that, that you'll run into the same issue at this location as this location, but it just may be further <clears throat> down. The other unknown is maybe the sediment has kind of worked its way through the system and the next big flood that you get when it happens will flush the sediment out and you won't have a new supply of sediment coming in taking its place. That's a possibility, but I wouldn't bank on it, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, so as velocity decreases, the larger debris gets dumped first. And the smaller it's carried further downstream. That, that's then, right. Yeah, you can see what happens is you get this effect where the larger cobble material drops out first, and then you turn it gets smaller, more gravel, and then as you get further downstream, it's more sandy sized material. So, and there's a lot of cobble in the system and gravel. So there, you know, there's a there's a pretty good supply of sediment that's come down. If I may ask, Mr. Hadley, when's the last time you visited the site in person? Uh, the last time I was out there, it's probably been a year, mm -hmm. probably been a year. Yeah. I asked because I visited today mm -hmm. and there's a channel and the channel is proximate to the south bank mm -hmm. and there's significant sandbars, gravel bars that extend quite a ways down. Um, I don't want to monopolize it. Are, are you an engineer by trade? I am a civil engineer, yes. Okay. so you. You understand the forces that any structure feels when it's perpendicular to the flow versus oh, yes. parallel. Yep. Parallel being the least of the forces, perpendicular being the most. Mm -hmm. Were there other options considered, like an angular ramp? Well, I mean, this ramp is at an angle. It's not at an extreme angle. Um, well, this, let's say this. At 45 degrees, you get, what, a 50% reduction in forces felt? Well, I mean, it's not exactly like that because the, the, the flow direction isn't, it turns as it hits structure. So, but I mean, yeah, let's just say for the sake of argument, sure. there's a reduction. Um, Was there any consideration to use the old boat ramp as a breakwater to protect the new one? Yeah, so uh, I actually have a slide that kind of addresses I'll that to proceed. a certain extent. Um, yeah. Yeah, during the, during the spring meeting, there were several questions that came up that uh, were, beyond my, my scope to be able to answer. And so that's uh, part of the reason we asked Mr. Hadley to come was to answer some of the commissioner's questions that came up during the original presentation. Yeah, so well, I, I ask for a number of reasons. One is one who has had some engineering training myself, and two is a person that's operated boats extensively mm -hmm. in fisheries enforcement. And I mean, there's a real difficulty trying to park a boat perpendicular to the current versus nose into the current. Oh, yeah, yeah. So why would we not improve our situation? Yeah. I can show you pictures of ramps on other rivers that are quite angular where they don't feel the forces of the river and protected by upstream riprap. Mm -hmm. Please proceed. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so there was, uh, there was multiple questions that uh, Phil provided me, but there was five of them that I thought that I could uh, address um, in a little more detail. One was, can we place a boat ramp? at the corner of this parking lot. And that was the question we've been talking about so far as moving it upstream. Um, how much will it cost to what, get? What does that mean? Which corner? Up by the bridge? Down? No, I think it's the existing main parking lot, uh, be the north west the corner. Next slide on the show us. Uh, board. There we go. Yeah. So the, the question that came up was the, which one was the? The red. Yeah. 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 Um, this corner of the parking lot oh, to be able okay. to bring it as close to right. that to minimize yeah. the impact on the green space. Now, that, that's already got a shallows in it already. You can see it today. Yeah. Um, so uh, then how much will it cost to get alternative drawings? So ba basically get back to where we are right now with 30% design drawings. Um, is dredging an option? Can a breakwater be built to keep the ramp in its current location? Uh, can the current ramp be repurposed for kayak paddleboard launching? So I'll kind of address each of those individually. Um, so we've talked a little bit about what's uh, about moving the ramp. So there are greater erosive forces upstream because again, you're getting into more of the pinch point from the, the gravel bar across the channel. 
uh, there's less protection because the existing riprap or vet manual are right at the end of that thing. Um, and so moving the ramp may require some additional, more extensive erosion protection. Um, and then we talked about the functionality may be decreased as sediment accumulates in the area. Um, we would have to update the hydraulic design and conduct a FEMA no rise analysis. We did that for the first ramp uh, location, so we would have to do that again. Uh, that would be a requirement. Um, and then the, uh, the civil designs would have to be updated for all the upland improvements and all the connections to the ramp uh, to do that. Um, and then, of course, there would be some additional costs for the design and the permitting uh, component of that. And so that was just the, the figure that we've been referring to that shows shows the, where that ramp would could potentially be moved and what and the, the issues that we discussed. Uh, uh, how much will it cost to get alternative drawings to uh, circle back with the civil design firm that did the design uh, and our hydraulic design combined? It's, it's about thirty five thousand dollars worth of effort to do that. Uh, but that doesn't include any environmental permitting or in, any additional compensatory mitigation costs that might go along with it. I'm not a permitting person, so I couldn't even tell you what that number would be. Um, that would be something that the Marine Board could probably provide. Uh, is dredging an option? Uh, so ever since Endangered Species Act, most dredging in rivers has kind of been curtailed unless there's uh, it's significant because of our critical facilities such as a water intake or something like that um, or if there's commercial navigation projects going on but what i've seen is that the the national marine fisheries and the, the permitting folks are pretty much don't want you to do any dredging uh, unless it's like a one-time thing that you can say that you'll never have to do it again you might be able to do it uh, but there's still going to be some mitigation costs associated with that. Um, so, and, and, and again, I haven't been involved in permitting of dredging projects, but I have been involved in projects that have a dredging component and a permitting requirement. So I hear and talk to the permitting folks and, and hear what the, the, uh, they have to say about the issues with getting these permits. And typically it's, it's very difficult and very costly to do, is really what it comes down to. Um, can a breakwater be built to keep a ramp in current location, or can the existing ramp be used as a breakwater? So breakwaters are more often than not used as a shelter for wave action. Uh, they can be used to help reduce velocities in areas. Um, they tend to work a lot better in areas where, where you've got a wind issue where you're trying to keep the waves out um, or you're trying to redirect the flow around where the ramp is located. But in this system, because you have so much sediment that you're dealing with, you can also create a sedimentation issue uh, when you start building breakwaters. The other issue is that you can create erosion. So depending on how the breakwater is configured, you can force the water in a direction that causes erosion in places that you did not intend. Um, and then there is a hydraulic impact associated with those. And that would be that you, as the, what you, when you put an obstruction in the river, you create a backwater condition that during a flood event can increase the flood risk upstream of that location. This is a FEMA floodway. so. Anything that you do in the floodway would require a no-rise analysis. And building a structure in the floodway, more than likely you're not going to get a, a no-rise analysis unless you can compensate for that by removing something somewhere else to, to regain that uh, loss of conveyance of floodwaters. So, and then getting a breakwater built or, or not built, but permitted uh, in this river would be, uh, I, it would be interesting to see if you could get that done. Uh, I think the permitting would be very challenging to do something like that. So I don't know if you wanna you know, ask further questions about a breakwater at this point. Well, I don't know that we, we may already have partial breakwater there in terms of the existing ramp to protect the new ramp. I understand what you're saying. I mean, I, I enjoyed hydraulics in college, yeah. and I get it. 
I just think of the, if one were to go to Woodland, Washington, to the North Fork of the Lewis, there's a ramp there called the Island Ramp, and it comes down probably at a 30 degree angle, mm -hmm. and it's, it's survived high flows, and it's a wonderful place to, to bring in because your nose in. And I just feel like these continued proposals of perpendicular or crossways to the current are unimaginative. And I wish that somebody would, you know, I, I had my own thoughts, Jerry and I walked the thing, and we talked about changing the direction of traffic flow in the, in the park from counterclockwise to clockwise, where you come in, you go counterclockwise, you go up, you come down this, back down this angle, the ramp, and mm -hmm. pull straight out and park. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the, the ramps would suffer the least damage, but I'm not designing this thing. There's just my thoughts from, from education and from running a patrol boat on the Columbia River. Yeah, sure. So. Yeah, and, and the reality is, is, is um, I mean, I am pretty versed with the hydraulic conditions of the ramp itself, but the upland improvements, at, you know, getting the parking lot and the, the traffic and all that other stuff is something that the Marine Board folks, you know, have really dealt with. Um, as far as an angled ramp, I know that the Marine Board has uh, certain criteria for most ramps and they discourage those angled ramps or highly angled ramps. I don't know the specific reason why, uh, but usually they don't discourage something unless they've had issues with it. So my suspicion is, is they've had experiences where those have had problems and so they kind of discourage using them. Um, I do know that as you have a very sharp angle on the ramp, you're right, it makes it very nice to come in and out of the water on your boat because you don't have those cross currents that you're dealing with but you also have a bank line that parallels the ramp for quite some distance that has to be very well protected because that's the area that you're concerned with. So um, it would just extend the, the riprap protection some distance that we would have to do in order to make that work. So um, I'm not saying it couldn't work, I'm just saying that there's issues that would be involved that would have to be dealt with. I don't know how much I want to get into boat handling. You and I both know that a boat under power directly into a current is more navigable than one oh, yeah. either downstream or crossways. So, yeah. yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, and then the, the last question had to do with repurposing the kite, the existing ramp for kite mm -hmm. paddleboard launching, and. When we did the analysis, the, the, all the no-rise analysis and everything, it assumed that that existing ramp would be removed and it would be converted back to an, kind of a gravel beach, like what you have upstream and downstream. Um, and that the rock rip wrap that was used for the repair, the recent repair, that would be repurposed for the new ramp so that you have some cost savings there. Um, but certainly, if you have a nice beach, you have an, a place for kayaks and paddleboards to launch anyways. So I don't know that you necessarily need a, uh, a ramp that you've got there now. And I do know that at certain conditions during low tide, uh, that the water kind of swoops over the top of that ramp and so it can make it a little bit dangerous at certain times for, for people to, to put in kayaks and paddleboards right at that location. So they probably more naturally would put in right downstream of it anyways. So I think that's, uh, yeah, that was it for my. So um, I have a couple more items to discuss and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A and additional comments. Um, Hans will be with us to answer additional questions as it relates to the hydrology of the, of the river and the boat ramp placements. Um, so in conversations with the Oregon State Marine Board and um, looking at what options could be available, uh, we have basically four different options that we could choose from uh, moving forward for the boat ramp. So our, our first option would be to move the boat ramp downstream 350 feet. That was the original proposal that uh, the Oregon State Marine Board uh, suggested that we move forward with. Option B would be to move the boat ramp downstream approximately 200 feet. That would be, again, kind of the in-between the, the current ramp location and the proposed ramp location. Option C would be to keep the boat ramp in the current location. And then option D is to remove the boat ramp. So if we were to qualify those options, that's if we want the money from the State Marine Board. 
Uh, I mean, there's other options. Is there an option to do nothing? There's an option to look at a, a, a different design entirely. Are those not options? Mm -hmm. Uh, to do nothing to basically be option C, and we'll, we'll go into each of the options a little bit, and we can, I can definitely answer questions as they. Well, then the come other up. question is: there another option to do a, an, an even different design that that would serve us better, uh, and not impact the park? There, there could be. Okay, so um, there's more than four options, is what I'm saying. Go ahead. Okay, uh, so so option A to move the boat ramp 350 feet downstream uh, benefits is that it is supported by the Marine Board and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, if approved by the city, uh, planning for the boat ramp and design permitting could begin almost immediately. Uh, the grant opportunities for that project would be up to approximately 75% of the cost of the project. Uh, so this was the original proposal again. Um, we did hear from the city commission that this was uh, a non-starter. So I am recognizing that, just letting you know this is an option as, as seen by the, the Marine Board and permitting agencies. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, probably for Mr. Headley. Um, when the original um, location for this 350 downstream downstream boat ramp was evaluated, mm -hmm. um, did you look at the full stretch of like where riprap was? I mean, how can you comment very briefly on on how you determined that the 350 feet downstream was the best location? given that whole stretch from the current boat ramp all the way out to, you know, the point where it's collecting debris. Right. Yeah. And so we, we walked that whole stretch and looked at it. And so we, we, we looked from very, the beginning of the riprap revetment on downstream. We didn't want to be upstream of the revetment just right. because it's, a, a, that's the area that has so much pressure on it from the gravel bar. And then as you walk downstream, you get less and less pressure from the gravel bar across the stream. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then you get a little too far and then you start running into all the woody debris issues, the large woody debris from the Willamette going over the top of it. So, so we kind of tried to pick a spot that's a happy medium in between those two that, that was as far away from the existing ramp as we felt comfortable with to, to you know, reduce the issues that you're already having there, but yet not get so far that now you're dealing with other issues like all the large wood debris. So there's no, there's no like magic, this is the spot. It was just that that seemed to make the most sense at the time. Kind of the most optimal. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we kind of optimize okay. what's the combination of getting away from the issues of the right. existing ramp and not creating new issues with moving it further downstream. Okay. Thank you. And that also had the greatest impact on our park green space, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Yeah. So this. But they wouldn't have been asked to look at that. Take that into consideration. They're looking at hydro hydraulics and the best place to put a boat ramp. That's, right? that's so correct. everything else is is kind of where our yeah, the, yeah. The, challenges the, lie. The, the, right. the location of the boat ramp was picked for the the best location for the ramp itself, right. but not necessarily the traffic flow and all the other components of it. Right. Although that was certainly looked at, we looked at m multiple different iterations of you know traffic flow patterns mm -hmm. and getting in and out of the ramp, um, and so. I would say that green space was on people's minds, but it wasn't the highest priority, I guess. Okay. Commissioner Rocky Smith, you had a question or comment? Well, I, I guess to Commissioner um, Smith's point, um, okay, thank you. we had three meetings. This is our third meeting. The first meeting was essentially the same options, and we said absolutely not. It came back. We basically said, you know, go for bringing us some more options. We came to another meeting which was with the same options. So essentially, we did say, go back and answer these questions, and that didn't happen. Um, and I kind of feel the same way tonight, although I feel like some of the, and we haven't gotten to the actual master plan concept, which I think makes a pretty good effort in addressing some of the issues, but I have more questions on that, I guess, than I knew. The, the actual presentation. I think this was um, very well explained. Um, and in fact, I think it might have been helpful for us to have that more detailed at the beginning because it was very clear on what's happening there and seeing the visuals has mm -hmm. been very helpful. Um, I guess I would kind of want the same presentation for the Willamette. 
Um, we've kind of been asking about the Willamette side. We've been told basically that's not an option, that's not doable. Well, I want to see that, that it's not doable. I can clearly see that this is a problem. Um, if I could see that as a commissioner, that the Willamette is a clearly a not an option, then we would stop asking that question. Um, but if Willamette's only not an option because the state doesn't want it, that's not a good enough reason for me. Um, so I think that's what we're struggling with right now. I don't want to spend a bunch of money replacing a boat ramp anywhere along that Clackamas River if we know that 10, 20 years ago, they're, 20 years ago, they're all going to have to be replaced or they're not going to exist. Um, so I think that's what we're struggling with is the answers to those pieces. A question from the gentleman on my left. Uh, well, and, and Rocky answered it, I guess, in part. Um, but the not supported by the city commission is that primarily the loss of green space? I mean, Rocky mentioned some other things as well. Correct. That was my understanding that uh, due to the loss of green space uh, with that design, that it would not be supported by the commission. Okay, so there wasn't anything else, any other challenges that just aren't listed here? That was for the, this option anyway. For option A, that was the primary reason that I was okay. given for the okay. not supporting option A. Okay. Do you have a number of what percentage of the park we would lose with this option? Uh, of, of the park uh, green space? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can look at, I don't know if I have a visual, it was about a, a quarter of the current okay. green space. Um, but right. the, the park as a whole is, you know, 20, 22, 20, 24 acres right around there, uh, depending on, on how you look at it, you incorporating the overflow parking area. Oh, yeah, incorporating overflow, the RV park, mm -hmm. and the unused correct. Tent, tent area. Correct. Yeah, so yes. that was the the okay. secondary uh, ask of the commission was to come back to look at mitigation strategies. So that's why we um, looked at, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about the conceptual master plan uh, after we look at the options for the boat ramp is the um, how we reuse that space, uh, knowing that, you know, maybe the, the boat ramp is a... Um, is a piece that needs to be in a certain area. You know, other things could be moved around to, to make better use of the space as a whole. And so we'll, we'll present a little bit more information on that as well. And you gather questions or comments from I, the members? Lisa? I have a comment, if I may. Uh, more of a philosophical statement question. Do we want a park with a boat ramp or do we want a boat ramp with a park? <laughs> That's a good way to phrase it. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. After Karen. Please, Karen. Um, you know, basically, I'm with Rocky. The Clackamas will always be the Clackamas. And in spite of that breach might have accelerated things, but the Clackamas has constantly brought gravel down. Mm -hmm. Back in the 1800s, there was a delta at the mouth, and the steamboats for three, four months out of the year couldn't get up to Oregon City. When I was a kid, there were dredges everywhere sure. out there, and they finally deepened that channel back out. But with no dredging, eventually we're going to have the delta back down there. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, not necessarily in our lifetime, but I'm questioning having a ramp along the Clackamas. Well, I agree. As one who has floated the Clackamas from way up top to the bottom, mm -hmm. there's embankments that are embedded with gravel, and it's just <clears> waiting to erode and drop into that river and come down. So I agree with your comment. I'd, I'd like to recognize Commissioner McGriff. I think she was next, and then back to Rocky again, please. Yeah, I, I think the, the uh, question that you asked, Lisa, is, is the same question that was asked uh, when we were building the library with the, one of the designs that we said, well, we can have a library that has a park in it, or we can have a park with a library in it. So this is probably that same thing. But um, you talked a little bit, Phil, about the mitigation, and uh, that's the area around the boat ramp is, is pretty denuded of vegetation. And I guess since I wasn't on this group when, when um, folks made that comment and decision about, well, the, the current one wasn't acceptable, um, I would be more interested at this point in time and knowing um, if the boat ramp is moved, uh, what's the mitigation for that area? I, I don't see continuing to keep all that. I don't know. I don't consider that a beach, but that's okay because I was raised on the ocean. I, I, was, I was down there recently um, with, a, with a canoe, and uh, it was the time of uh, a, couple, a week ago, and the people in the little 
one-seater kayaks were having a great time at the end of the boat ramp because of the, the eddy that was created there. And they were just going in and out and turning it upside down and doing everything. And I guess that only happens a couple of times a year. So we, uh, a couple of times a month. So we launched uh, a little bit downstream where that little notch is so we could get the canoe in the river and not deal with the kayak people. But kind of that area where you have on the picture, it says upstream ending of riprap, that whole area is just, I don't know. Yeah, and there there would be required mitigation through the permitting process. So there, there would be some habitat improvements that probably would be required through the JPA. Um, additionally, looking at the overall um, master plan and what how we develop the park, there's opportunities of some of the spaces that are currently asphalted where we could do some uh, greening of those spaces as well. Uh, so there are there are opportunities within the park, but um, yeah, we would obviously need to take up a, a portion of the green space in order to move the boat ramp. Yeah, well, is is the is the Oregon State Marine Board just completely flatly against having a boat ramp someplace else? I mean, not necessarily. On the Willamette, they are uh, they are opposed to spending more money on it uh, with the. Um, with the amount of time and research that has gone into the, the current I placements. Okay. And so if the if it was the, the will of the, the city to move forward with doing our own design and our own... Um, They're all for that. It, they, they would be <laughs> fine with, with evaluating that. And depending on what came back from the study, uh, they may well support that. They just, you know, they have limited resources, Sources, just right. like other agencies. And um, they have proximities to their amenities that they want to keep. So um, the parking facilities, the restroom facilities within a certain area of the boat mm -hmm. ramps. And so if we moved it onto the Willamette side, we would, they would have a request that we have uh, facilities adjacent to those areas. So it would be a substantial investment by the city and uh, as well as the Marine Board if we, we moved into a different area. And that may be part of the total discussion as to the RV park and its future and other things. Mm -hmm. Chair recognizes Rocky Smith, followed by Mr. Bill Daniels. So what I'm worried about is all of my questions had to do with the concept plan uh, that it was presented to us, which we've not even got to. We've got like 20 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, that whole concept is what's going to determine whether or not we can settle for this. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we're going to have to have another meeting. And it, this meeting maybe should have been two hours or three hours. I don't know, because we keep pushing this back. Um, I, I guess I'm kind of surprised that, you know, at this third meeting, we're being told the state's not going to spend any more money towards this project unless we kind of come up with a solution. Well, the first meeting, we said that it didn't work. The second meeting, we said it still doesn't work. Third meeting, we said it doesn't work, and we're still spending. Why were they still? They should have stopped spending money at the first presentation when they knew we weren't going to go for it. Um, I think the concept map, like I said, has some abilities to take, you know, add new green space to mit mitigate, you know, having the, the ramp where it's being presented to be right now. But we haven't had that conversation. We haven't even had a conversation of whether we want the RV park to exist or not. And that concept plan, which is visibly, you know, pretty great, is maybe something that's doable. But I have a lot of questions on that, and we haven't even got there yet. Um, so I don't know, um, you know, how much time we're going to be able to talk about that piece of it. Uh, I, can, I can go through the other kind of... The background on the options that are available for the boat ramp specifically, uh, especially with, with hands here. And then um, I can go over briefly the conceptual master plan. And then if there's an interest to reschedule another meeting to just talk about the conceptual plan, I want to obviously make the best use of having consultant time here. But um, Understood. That may be a good approach. We'll take deal with the boat ramp, with the consultant here, with the experts here, and then we'll do what needs to be done in the master plan because it needs a thorough evaluation. Yeah. Mr. Daniels, you asked to speak. Thanks. I'm not a boater, but I, I do uh, like to um, be involved with my parks, and the green space is more important to me than a boat ramp. I know we have Meldrum Bar just right across the river with three very good ramps much larger park, of course, and can handle that kind of traffic. I'm not sure we need a boat ramp at Clackamat Park. 
and I can leave it at that. Um, on that question, I think one of our last meetings, um, I asked that specific question, yep. where's the need study that says we need this ramp? We haven't gotten that answer. Um, Sportscraft, remember, was one ramp until we doubled it to, to basically double the capacity of that ramp. Um, we have not since then done any study when the boat ramp was closed for frequent, well, you know, we had to close the boat ramp for a year or two, how long was it closed? We've done no studies since the sports craft ramp to dis to really understand what is the usage of those ramps and whether we actually need the one at Clackwood Park. And that's not something, I mean, I've asked multiple times, we've not seen that. I would agree with that. Sometimes you get tunnel vision, you do something because that's how you've always done it. Maybe that Mr. Uh, Daniel's option is definitely worth discussion. Mm -hmm. Anyone else from this, this group? Okay, Philip, you want to continue on? Yeah. Uh, so the, the second option, which is the option that we discussed, uh, kind of the in-between uh, the current ramp and the proposed ramp of 350 feet, would be to move the boat ramp 200, um, sorry, 200 feet downstream. So the benefit of that is that is potentially feasible, uh, as Mr. Hadley spoke in his technical memo, uh, further study is needed. Uh, there would be uh, an additional cost associated with that that would need to be paid for by the city. Um, we, the Oregon State Marine Board did, um, did provide a 30% set based on moving the boat ramp 350 feet downstream and they're not willing to uh, fund additional study on the interim, uh, the in-between boat ramp location. Um, so with option B, it does minimize green space impact. So there's less impact uh, in that, that space because it's only 200 feet down, down river. Um, and then if it is supported by the Marine Board and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, grant opportunities would be available up to 75% of the, the project cost. Um, the caveat to that is that the Marine Board did state that if the expense of the, um, uh, as Mr. Hadley spoke to, need to beef up, uh, the riprap and the other um, uh, structure underneath the ramp in the in-between location, uh, if it's uh, substantially more than a different um, design, they may only cover up to a certain percentage, uh, but that would be, again, um, uh, to the ter determination of the board, the Oregon State Marine Board. And to reiterate Karen Morey's statement, the Clackamas will be the Clackamas at 200 feet up plus or minus, up or down, so please proceed. Uh, so option C would be to keep the camp, the ramp in the current location. So the benefits, uh, the ramp would stay. Uh, there would be no impact on green space. Challenges is that it's not supported by the Marine Board or the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, boaters and anglers have been frustrated with the usability of the ramp in the current location. As Denise described, the, the eddy and the uh, changing current, it's difficult to use in that location. Um, the Marine Board and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife would not support rebuilding the ramp in this location once repairs are needed. So if repairs are needed, we would need to go through a, um, a joint permit application process. Uh, we would not have the support of the Marine Board or uh, Fish and Wildlife. That uh, may make it very difficult or impossible to actually receive uh, approvals to move forward with repairs in the current location. Uh, all costs of repairs would be the city's responsibility. And then the Marine Board has also stated that repayment would be required for previous grants. So the current uh, usability life cycle of the grants that have been used uh, to install the ramp in the current location and then to use some of those materials uh, to move the ramp downstream. Um, so the rough estimate that I received from the Marine Board would be that um, the Marine Board would be requesting approximately 200 to $250,000 in repayment from the city if, um, if we did not have a boat ramp, which basically option C or D would include uh, in their mind not having a boat ramp because we would not be able to make uh, improvements at that location. So the abandonment, the total abandonment of a boat ramp would cost the city 250,000? You decided uh, not to put a boat ramp in that part? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, option D is pretty much the same as option C, which would be to remove the boat ramp. So we would have additional green space available. We obviously wouldn't need the uh, trailer parking, um, the additional asphalt in that area. Uh, we could make additional green space available. Challenges is that the, the ramp is heavily used and would be missed by boaters and angling uh, community members. 
Uh, there would be a loss of maintenance assistant program funds uh, from the Marine Board. So we do receive funds annually to help maintain the, the parking lot, the restrooms, uh, the kind of shared facilities at that location. Um, and then the repayment would be required as I stated on the previous option. Uh, so with that, we had a, um, uh, we had a consultant, uh, help us come up with a conceptual master plan for the location, um, that was included in your staff packet, uh, which would hopefully mitigate some of the, um, the changes that would be required with moving the boat ramp. Uh, so the boat ramp in the conceptual master plan is that option B as shown. So that would be again, 200, 200 feet uh, down river from the current boat ramp location. And um, we try to incorporate many different, um, uh, different pieces into the conceptual master plan, including uh, looking at um, the uh, connectivity, particularly with the, the pedestrian connectivity to and through the park. Uh, we try to look at the um, climate resiliency and the high water events that we typically see in the park, um, moving the uh, RV park from the current location, which is here up to the um, across the street uh, location where the current overflow parking is. In the current design, uh, we did try to mitigate the loss of the overflow parking and increased uh, additional parking spots in the um, regular parking areas for the boat ramp, as well as additional car parking along specific strategic areas within the park. Um, in addition, we expanded the play area and created better connectivity to the skate park and incorporating it into the overall play elements of the design. Uh, one of the other pieces that we looked at was to try to use, as we discussed previously, is when we do have high water events along the Willamette River, uh, that this section often floods. And so we have an opportunity there to allow this area to flood more regularly without impacting the RV park. And then the ability to have um, the lower section green area flood without impacting a lot of the built infrastructure that's more expensive to, to maintain and, and keep up in flooding events. So we took a lot of those concepts. Again, this is a conceptual master plan, um, high level, but we're trying to show what is possible within uh, the, the current footprint of a park that we have if we wanted to relook at how we're using the park. I do have a handout, uh, which I'll pass out, which shows um, the amount of uh, current green space and play areas uh, which are on the park. And then with the conceptual master plan, uh, where we go for uh, the square footage of those areas. So as an example, the green space in the um, current uh, configuration has uh, about 430,000 square feet of green space. The conceptual master plan shows 464,000 square feet of green space. So about 30,000 uh, square feet more of, of green space within the footprint of the park in just doing that reconfiguration and better using the space that we do have. <coughs> With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, elaborate, or have Mr. Hadley answer questions with uh, knowing that um, we have the consultant on hand. A question from Mayor Dan Holliday. I'm concerned that moving the RV park up to the overflow parking makes it substantially less desirable for the folks who come mm -hmm. to use that RV space. Mm -hmm. um, seem to me it looks like you have this big flat hot expanse of asphalt compared to what we have now which is really close to the river mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm wondering you know how people are going to get from the RV park down to the river because right now there's a railing across there there's no access point other than the main entrance to the park yeah we did have uh, several conversations with public works in regards to mm -hmm. pedestrian connectivity into the park um, so what we'd be proposing is instead of the current entrance location, which is kind of up here in this area, is to move it to a three-way entrance into the park, uh, creating a um, more usable and noticeable uh, pedestrian access at the corner and over. At that point, they would have full access and more appropriate pedestrian connectivities through the park area. And then where are you going to put the RV dump station? Uh, in the current location, we would propose that the RV dump station or that the uh, RV park would have permanent hookups and we 
are proposing not to have the RV dump station in this area. Uh, if it's uh, a priority for the commission, you know, we can obviously include it or we can move it to another location. Uh, but being prime real estate close to the river uh, didn't, didn't make a lot of sense to continue to have that there without, uh, with having permanent uh, hookups for the RV park okay, users. Sir. Thank you. Ms. Maury. Um, I have a partial answer to that too. Although the current location is beautiful, the park's popular because of lack of availability. When I worked at the chamber, people would call and ask where there were uh, transient RV parks. Can be. <laughs> There's literally nothing else in the area except the Clackamette Park. So I think a few plantings up there might make it more attractive, but it's popular because there's no place else to go. I was there today and I can tell you, and Phil can tell you, the park actually operates at a profit regardless of flooding conditions mm -hmm. yep. and recovery. And it's actually a beautiful location. And had, if we were to dress it up, either maybe we either go all in or get all out. But I mean, that's a beautiful location. Maybe we need to think about restructuring it and make it more marketable. The current rates, unbelievably, are $25 for not on the waterfront and $30 for on the waterfront. I don't know where you get that price anywhere in America other than here. Commissioner Smith. So I don't know what year it was, but it was in the last five, 10 years that conversation happened. Um, and there was a master plan for making the RV park an amazing park. Um, which should be included in this packet because I know it was not more than 10 years ago because I think it was in the, I, when the construction class at the high school was very involved in building park structures, they built the kiosk that's down at Clagmut Park RV Park as part of the master plan that we created for what that RV park was going to look like when we realized that it was making money and that if we wanted to, to make it a really amazing place that we really needed to build that fully out, um, pave it and, and make really nice spots and there's a plan for that. And I don't know why that plan's not in part of this package. I tried to find it, um, but we need to find it because that we should be able to look at that too. I, I think this concept is actually very smart. I have some questions about it. I think some have been answered, but we need to spend a work session just talking about that because until we understand and really decide what we want that park to look like, we're not gonna make a decision on that boat ramp. There's no way we're gonna make a decision of any kind with that boat ramp and just assume that we're gonna let them move forward on a boat ramp until we've built the rest of the park out because we're not gonna just say, oh, well, we'll, we'll retain and we'll add the missing green space later. We know that won't happen. So until we have a plan in place to making sure that entire vision happens, I don't see wanting to support moving forward on a concept for that boat ramp because even if we can start on the boat ramp tomorrow and they build it, um, it's going to be another 10 years before we actually be able to replace this space that we're losing. Um, and we can't do that. We won't do that. I can't imagine we would do that. So we're approaching the end of the allocated time. I ask that comments be brief if possible. It will be. I, I'd just like to recommend that we um, have a, a, a follow-up uh, work session with PRAC to talk about the master plan. And I think that this is a really good start. I'd like to see less pavement and a little more pervious surfaces. And I don't know why there could be minimal pavement in the RV park and then some of the other areas could be pervious pavers or some other sort of system so you don't have so much asphalt. But um, the idea of having continued flooding at the RV park is, is not really to our benefit. So I would just like to request that we have another follow-up. I think the commission, this group would be in agreement with that. Is there anybody not in agreement with that concept? Okay, let's schedule that for a future date and do that. And uh, is there any closing comments or questions by anyone before we conclude the meeting? Did you have something else? No. Okay, we've reached the appointed hour of time allocated for this. I'm going to bring this meeting to a close. Thank you, everyone.